What is America? People who live in Connecticut know it as a land of templed hills and wooded valleys. Sparkling streams and crystal lakes. Rivers bridged by graceful spans. Protected coastlines and harbors where ships of commerce discharge their cargo. A land of friendly towns whose shops and factories produce the goods which serve a nation. White steeple churches on historic greens. Homes mellow with the traditions of centuries. Majestic elms arching village streets, only minutes distant from busy cities. A land of plenty where farms are rich in crops. The fertile soil yields a bountiful harvest, bringing forth all the good things of the earth. These farms, these fields, these crops, this full abundance is Connecticut. Here, broad scenic highways lead gay family groups to beaches, parks, and playgrounds. And here the crowds which gather are a free and happy people. Fair play is honored by the nation. It's not who wins that counts, but how he plays the game. We burn no books, but treasure them in libraries and schools where all may read and learn. The ivied walls of universities endure as monuments to freedom of the mind. Our children wear the uniforms of sturdy pioneers, not the dark shirts of a dictator's fancy. In this land, brave men have built a nation. Here liberty was born, democracy made workable. Today, free men and women freely assemble to choose candidates for office to keep alive the process of democracy. Government of the people, by the people, for the people is the American way. Here, government still derives its powers from the consent of the governed. Freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of the airways, freedom of worship, these are America's precious heritage. All this is a, a way of life, a way that has been found good by generations of citizens, a way we are determined to preserve for those who follow as it was preserved for us. But now this way of life is threatened. It is in danger. Wherever danger threatens or disaster strikes, telephone forces trained in defense of a vital service swing into action. They know how to get tough jobs done, how to overcome obstacles, how to work together. They know how to rush supplies to the scene of trouble, how to restore broken lines, how to speed calls through busy switchboards in times of stress. Today, as new storm warnings are raised, our country, our way of life, must be defended. short, the all-out for defense has sounded, and as the youth of Connecticut answered the call to arms, the industries of Connecticut answered the call for arms. All-out defense means all-out production, and this is a job that Connecticut well understands. Her leadership in industry dates from revolutionary times when the ingenuity of a Connecticut Yankee, Eli Whitney, first made mass production possible. Ever since those days, Connecticut cities and towns have been world famous for an infinite variety of manufactured goods. Hundreds of these products are now vitally needed to train and equip our soldiers, sailors, and airmen. And so all through the night, 
in shops and factories across the state, wheels are turning and lights burn bright. East Hartford, Connecticut, leads the nation in making aircraft engines and propellers. Gunsmiths answer call for guns, and still more guns. New Haven, forges hammer out the Army's new Garand rifle. Meriden, bomb noses produced in lampshade factories. Middletown, webbing for cartridge belt. Bridgeport, electric cable for battleship. Ball bearings for war machines. tools for all defense industries. Connecticut factories help outfit our new army from head to foot. Nimble fingers at Norwalk fashion hats for mounted command. While at Norwich, wool is carded, spun and woven into cloth for army overcoats. Connecticut silversmiths devote their skill to making tableware for battle fleets and forts for army mess kits. Connecticut girls economize on silk stockings, so mills like this one at Putnam can make silk thread for parachutes. On these strong threads hang the lives of our airmen. Connecticut tops the nation in pouring forth cartridges millions daily. Connecticut birthplace of submarines today leads America in their production. And Connecticut ingenuity works an industrial miracle in this plant near New Haven, which emerging from a weed patch is built, equipped, tooled, manned, and delivering machine guns in the amazing time of seven months. Little Connecticut is playing a big part in making America the arsenal of democracy. Her industry today is racing the clock to fill a $600 million order for Army and Navy needs alone. blazing lights in Connecticut factories after midnight. Defense plants respond to the all-out every hour of the 24. New factories are built. Others expand. More men and women are employed. Business races the clock and reaches for the telephone. Here is a Connecticut defense plant that reaches for the telephone 22,000 times a day. More than half a million calls a month. And that's only one plant. With as many telephones as a small city, this organization requires a private switchboard. As the factory grows, telephone installers enlarge its switchboard and dial equipment to provide for still more calls. Increasing employment and mounting payrolls bring new life to cities and towns. 
new demands for home telephone. Houses spring up. Whole communities develop within a few months, like the vast housing projects for defense workers and their families in Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, and other cities. What has all this unprecedented activity meant to the telephone forces? Let us look at some results. Three and a half million more toll calls are being handled by the Southern New England Telephone Company this year than last. The increase in local calls is staggering. 63 million. And the net increase in telephones in service is going up, up, up. What will happen in 1942? Even telephone Johnny himself can't get. As Connecticut reaches for the telephone, there must be more telephones, more switchboards, more poles, more cable, more of everything needed to give telephone service. Additional switchboard positions in some places, whole new buildings in others. This year, linemen will add to Connecticut's telephone network another billion feet of wire and cable, enough to circle the globe eight times. This means greatly increased expenditures for materials, for wages, for taxes. The Southern New England Telephone Company is spending for construction, maintenance, and operation two and a half million dollars every month. The Western Electric Company, the Bell Systems Service of Supply, provides vast amounts of the telephone equipment required today. This equipment flows in a never-ending stream from Western's great manufacturing plants and strategically located warehouses. And research for more substitute telephone materials goes on steadily in the Bell Laboratory. Telephone expansion means adding new employees and training them. Operators learn switchboard technique from skilled instructors. Recruits join the accounting force. Others are coached in business office work. In telephone school rooms, installers learn the ABCs of putting in telephones. Repairmen learn the fine points of troubleshooting. New linemen learn the art of working aloft from the ground up. In these days, fire departments rely on swift, dependable communication service more than ever before. The telephone and radio aid local police forces in protecting lives and property. Teletypewriter and telephone service are invaluable to the state police and the FBI. Naval, military, and civic agencies require more switchboards, more telephones, and additions to the private branch exchanges of Connecticut's industries will serve 350% more telephones this year than last. In one Connecticut town, 2,000 acres of farmland were selected for transformation into an Army air base. We'll need telephones, said the Army. And like industrial and civilian telephone orders, this one called for careful planning by telephone engineers. Army officers and telephone men discussed the special requirements. Poles must be set, lines built, and cables spliced together to provide service while the base is still under construction. Engineers' plans become equipment installed by specialists. When the flyers take over, a made-to-order telephone system is ready for their use. As the telephone serves industry, so it serves the armed forces that guard industry from attack. Behind the scenes of this spectacular drama, at telephone switchboards and in central offices, men and women of the Bell system are doing their job providing the service upon which Connecticut and the nation depend, a service which must not fail. And speeding to the front lines of the battle of production are telephone men who work shoulder to shoulder with the Minutemen of industry, matching their skill and experience with that of other Connecticut master craftsmen.
Vermont has sounded. Connecticut answers. And telephone forces answer too.